Who were the great prehistoric predators? What roles did they play in their ecosystems? How did they evolve? Predators have always been a source of fascination. They frighten as much as they captivate. Every ecosystem has a predator at the top of the food chain. As far back as life can be traced, as soon as it managed to enrich, multiply and diversify, predators were born and alpha predators established themselves at the top of this interaction between species. You're familiar with alpha predators, also known as apex predators, who reign supreme over their territory. But are you familiar with those who lived on Earth millions of years ago? Would you be frightened to see a Dimetrodon? How would you react to a Helicoprion? You've heard of the T-Rex or the Spinosaurus, but what do you really know about these gigantic predators? These extraordinary predators tell us a lot about the evolution of living organisms and their descendants. They developed extraordinary abilities to rise to the top of the food chain and reign supreme over their territory. Would you be willing to meet them to find out more about them? Dear Traveler, welcome! Today we're going back in time to follow in the footsteps of the most incredible predators the Earth has ever known. I invite you to follow me on a journey where the nuance between fear and fascination is almost imperceptible. The animals that await us are both majestic and frightening, dangerous and captivating, monstrous and extraordinary. But before you leave for a new adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thank you, and have a great trip! Super predators are as majestic as they are disturbing. Their size, power, speed, and hunting strategy place them at the top of the food chain. When they reach adulthood, almost no animal attacks a member of this species. If they did, they would quickly win the fight. They fear nothing and no one. We call them alpha predators. If we stop at this brief description, we might conclude that they are nothing more than monstrous, bloodthirsty, aggressive beasts. But in the animal kingdom, and in nature in general, the balance of life is far more complex than appearances suggest. They may be terribly frightening, but they have a key role to play in the ecosystem. Without them, the very cycle of life would be weakened and would gradually collapse over the years and centuries like a house of cards. There would be nothing left. Everything would collapse. But what consequences could there be after the disappearance of an environment's apex predators? Would their disappearance really be so serious? A few more herbivores and small carnivores at most, but so what? To understand the crucial role of these apex predators, we need to define what an ecosystem is and what it represents for the species that depend on it. An ecosystem is a framework that rests on two pillars. The framework is the delimitation, the territory granted to it, for example, the Amazon rainforest. The two pillars on which the ecosystem is entirely based are the biotype and the biocenosis. The biotype is a geographical environment with its own specific characteristics, such as geology, temperature, climate, and humidity. If one of these elements is modified, the ecosystem is weakened. 
The biocenosis represents all living species interacting with this biotype. These may be animals, plants, microorganisms, and even human beings, if we refer to today's ecosystems. Here again, everything is linked. When one of the elements that make up and characterize a biotype, or biocenosis, disappears, everything collapses. One cannot survive without the other. If a species becomes too invasive, it takes precedence over other characteristics of the biocenosis or biotype. It harms its environment. It no longer interacts with its ecosystem, but dominates it. And that changes everything. It breaks the balance and harmony of the entire ecosystem. Alpha predators help regulate the species they consume, without which they would become invasive and cause the loss of all other species dependent on this ecosystem. You were no doubt already aware of this role through today's apex predators. Herbivores are often more numerous, small carnivores less so, and large predators generally live in smaller numbers. Their way of life requires a greater need for energy and a larger territory, which limits the expansion of their population. The whole animal community depends on this balance between species. But you should also know that a super predator, like all predators in general, whatever its place in the food chain, doesn't hunt blindly. In other words, it chooses its prey. Generally speaking, it preys on animals that are old, sick, ill-formed, parasitized, weak or weakened. In so doing, it acts as a healthy regulator, if we can put it that way. This regulation promotes and preserves the good health of the animal populations hunted. Finally, it's important to understand that the presence of some of these large predators in the food chain also plays an important role in the geographical landscape. We call them engineer species. Their very presence modifies the environment in which they live. By regulating certain herbivore species, for example, richer, more luxuriant vegetation can flourish, allowing other species to establish themselves The case of Yellowstone in the USA is a fine example of the positive impact of apex predators. For almost 70 years, the wolf had completely disappeared from the landscape. Since then, the consequences have become increasingly dramatic year after year. Elk proliferated. The number of individuals exploded, rising from 4,000 to 10,000 depending on the year to nearly 20,000. They took over an ever-expanding territory, even grazing near rivers. This species has developed to the detriment of beavers, whose colonies have almost tripled in number. There were almost 130 colonies, and after 70 years without wolves, there were less than 50 left. The coyote, had taken on too much importance since their disappearance. It had spread species such as pronghorn, antelope, and small rodents, without being able to regulate the elk. Yet these animals played an essential role in their environment, and also fed birds of prey, which eventually almost disappeared too. The landscape changed completely. The soils dried up and even the riverbank flora struggled to survive. Deprived of the beavers acting as architects, rivers and streams increased their flow and caused soil erosion. Many fish, amphibians, and insects did not survive these drastic changes. If we carried on like this, one day there would be nothing left in the region but elk. Then, deprived of food, and with vegetation becoming increasingly scarce, they too would have met their demise. Between 1995 and 1997, 
41 wolf specimens entered Yellowstone Park. Since then, the population has been maintained at between 80 and 100 individuals within the park, and 400 individuals have expanded their territory in the immediate vicinity. The positive impact of the wolf's presence has been measured in Yellowstone. Since its arrival, the elk population has plummeted, making way for beavers. The coyote, which had tended to thrive without the presence of the wolf, has regained its place in the ecosystem. The coyote population has declined in favor of the species it consumed. Scavengers and beavers have also returned to populate the surrounding area. The riverbanks have greened up. The streams are repopulated. In short, the balance has been restored. When we study the predator-prey cycle, i.e. the number of individuals in a predator and the number of individuals in the prey it consumes, like lynx and hare, for example, we realize this harmony and balance between species. When there is a lot of prey, the number of predators increases. As soon as the prey population falls, so do the number of predators. Life depends on this balance between species. Biotope and biocenosis are linked. The survival of the entire ecosystem depends entirely on the harmonious interaction between these two key elements. Today, the fragility of certain ecosystems, due in particular to global warming and human activity, has become the challenge of our civilization. This is the challenge of the 21st century. But in the distant past of Earth's history, other ecosystems have known their own dangers, their own fragility, and their own challenges. The alpha predators of these ecosystems were essential to their preservation and to the maintenance of that same balance, fair and harmonious. In 2022, scientists discovered what could be the first known predator in the animal kingdom. Celebrating its 560 millionth birthday, it lived during the Edia Karen, the period preceding the Cambrian. It is an Aurora Lumina, Aten Boragai. I guess it's not exactly your idea of a predator. It doesn't have the physical features of a dangerous, aggressive animal. Yet scientists believe it to be one of the earliest predators known to man. Judging by its flame-shaped tentacles, the animal is probably a member of the Nidarian family. Today, this group includes animals such as jellyfish, coral, and sea anemones. They appeared when life began to explode in the oceans. To regulate and create an initial balance, a predator was needed. The predator-prey cycle could then be established, fostering and maintaining the very first terrestrial ecosystem to hatch. The predators that await us are nothing like Aurora Lumina at Enboragai. If the animals at the bottom of the chain are evolving, as in the case of filter feeders, suspension feeders and herbivores, so too are piscivores and carnivores. Predators adapt to the prey they hunt. It's time for us to begin our journey through time to the very first prehistoric predator in our series. It lived in the marine territories of the Cambrian. We're in the middle of the ocean over 500 million years ago. If we leave, the Aurora Lumina and change predators were once again faced with aquatic predators, and with good reason. At that time, no animal had yet set foot on land. The continent knew neither predators nor prey. Even vegetation had yet to conquer this hostile environment. On land, the landscape is desolate. Time seems to stand still. 
No life on the horizon. Nothing. Only rocks, dust, and scorching heat. No one could survive down here. In the ocean, however, everything is different. Water is synonymous with life. And it's not for nothing that we begin with this period. It was during this period that a major event took place, the Cambrian Explosion. A sudden appearance on a geological time scale of around 10 million years of almost all the major organizational plans known today. It's still in its infancy, but its richness is already widely visible. Look around you. The ocean is teeming with life. This is the home of the Animalacaris, whose name means strange shrimp. It's a large marine arthropod. Far from being as impressive as the great white shark or the orca, it is nonetheless the Cambrian sea monster. Our Animalacaris is just under a meter long. While its size is respectable, it's not its main hunting asset. What makes it the alpha predator of the Cambrian seas is its mouth. As you can see, it's equipped with sharp bony plates that have the ability to crush its prey with disconcerting ease. But before we delve a little deeper into this fine hunter's modus operandi, let's take a look at his physical portrait. As I was saying, Animalacaris means strange shrimp. It's aptly named, to say the least. It's an arthropod, in other words, a segmented invertebrate. Its eyes are rod-shaped, like many of today's insects. It already has well-developed eyes, even though we're still in the early stages of biological evolution. They are made up of facets. It also has swimming legs. This is what enables it to move in water. Last but not least, and perhaps most impressive of all, after its mouth, it has gripping appendages, bristling with spikes. This physical singularity enables it to seize its prey and never let go. Now that we've described its most attractive physical features, I think it's time for you to see it in action. When he's on the move, it's usually because his body is driven by hunger. That's when they go in search of prey. It's a veritable trilobite crusher. Trilobites abounded in the oceans during the Cambrian period. They came in all sizes. The Paleozoic is the golden age of these marine animals. Most trilobites measured just a few centimeters. However, a few species could reach 60 to 70 centimeters. Over 18,000 species evolved during the Paleozoic. They occupied many ecological niches, from the littoral zone to the deep sea. Most moved by walking on the seabed, others dug galleries, while others swam freely in water columns. These animals, widely present in the world's seas and oceans, were the Animalacaris' main source of nutrition, even if it occasionally ate other marine species. Thanks to its spiked appendages, it could seize a trilobite and bring it easily to its mouth. Then, like a camera shutter, it would open wide and crush the trilobite with its many plates. Its appendages and mouth are formidable weapons, but it's important to look at its eyes, too. Indeed, recent discoveries have demonstrated its great visual capacity. Animalacaris had highly developed eyes. The eye is our main organ of communication with the outside world, and it's a complex one. In many predators, it is also an asset for hunting. This is precisely the case with the Animalacaris. Its eyes were about 2 to 3 centimeters, 1 inch, long, with 16,000 facets known as a motidea. These are light-sensitive receptors. 
Many insects have faceted eyes, as does the Animalacaris, but the difference lies in the number of facets. By way of comparison, the fly has 4,000 facets. The dragonfly, on the other hand, is an excellent hunter with almost 28,000 facets. The Animalacaris, with its 16,000 Amatidea, has exceptional vision, making it a formidable hunter. As we mentioned earlier in our journey among prehistoric super predators, alpha predators played an essential role in the regulation and evolution of species. According to scientists, the presence of this unrivaled hunter in the oceans could be at the origin of the Cambrian explosion. By exerting strong selection pressure, it may have contributed to the major diversification of animal species. But he's not the only one to reap the rewards of this formidable diversification of marine fauna. Another great Cambrian predator is Herdia victoria. As you'll see, it's very similar to Animalacaris. The study of several hundred Canadian fossils has given researchers a better idea of Herdia and its position. In the Animalacaridae family, animals renowned for their relatively large size and well-toothed mouths, their hunting prowess earned them the nickname Cambrian T-Rex. Just imagine how fearsome they could have been. Like the Animalacaris, the head carries a pair of small spiked limbs. These are spiny claws of a sort. The animal uses them to bring prey to its mouth. The lateral lobes have large gills for breathing. It also has a hollow spiky shell protruding from the front of its head. Shells are generally used to preserve and protect certain organs. In the Herdia victoria, however, this is not the case. Scientists therefore set out to unravel the mystery of this famous shell and discover more about the animal's lifestyle. According to the most recent studies, no organs were found inside the shell. Nevertheless, the shell was useful for the Herdia, enabling it to stay afloat more easily by controlling its buoyancy. Thanks to this ability, he could explore the seabed with greater ease and hunt down the many prey species around him. Like the Animalacaris, it too had a mouth armed with plates. The Herdia, on the other hand, was smaller, averaging 20 centimeters or 8 inches. It also had slightly finer appendages than the Animalacaris. As a result, it didn't step on the toes of its predatory counterpart and fed on smaller animals, but it was still a great hunter and an alpha predator because no other animal hunted it. While fauna and flora exploded in the Cambrian and became increasingly diverse, prey remained much the same, as did their predators. These two were undoubtedly the rulers of the seas at the time, but in a few million years' time, other predators will enter the scene. It's already time for you to meet them and take a leap back in time. We're off to the Ordovician and Silurian eras. One of the earliest known Eurypterids, Megalograptus, lived during the Upper Ordovician. It became a super predator of the Ordovician and Silurian seas alongside other animals of the same ilk, such as Pteragotus. Related horseshoe crabs appeared a little later and still live in the oceans. Megalograptus and Pterigotus are often referred to as sea scorpions. They are indeed scorpion-like. But these Eurypterids were much, much bigger than any scorpions you've ever seen. The first, Megalograptus, measured one meter or three feet. The second, Pterygotus, was close to 1.60 meters 
and even 1.75 meters for the largest specimens. If they're a little frightening at first sight, rest assured, there's absolutely nothing to risk if you get a little closer. They will give us the opportunity to learn more about their morphology and therefore their hunting methods. Their bodies are divided into two parts, the front and the back. The front part, called the prosoma, consists of the Eurypterid's head. Both Megalograptus and Pterygotus have a pair of chelicerae on the head, close to the mouth and ending in two hooks, as well as pedipalps. A pedipalp is a kind of flexible forceps. These are used for eating. The rear part, also known as the opisthosome, is made up of several bands known as tergites. Tergites are the hardened plate-like segments of an arthropod. This characteristic is also found in other species. The opisthosome, the rear part of the animal, ends in a point called the telson. It's hard to say whether the telson was venomous. Several hypotheses have been put forward. One of them suggests an attack-based predation tool, like a spike or spear, to block prey and then bring it to the mouth without resorting to any venom. Pterygotus was the largest of all Eurypterids at the time, but also one of the largest of all known arthropods. Carnivorous, it fed on Brontoscorpio, the oldest known scorpion, measuring nearly one meter or three feet in adulthood, and Cephalaspis, one of the first agnathic fish, vertebrates that did not yet have jaws. It has four pairs of legs to get around. A fifth pair is more like flippers. These enabled it to swim. It is probable that its tail was used to gain speed when it wanted to swoop down on prey. Thanks to its large pincers, it could grasp animals and hold them firmly to prevent them escaping. But thanks to his exceptional eyesight, he was quick enough to ensure that this rarely happened. According to some analyses, Terry Gotis may have had two pairs of eyes. The larger eyes were faceted, like some insects, such as flies and dragonflies, but also like the Animalicaris we met earlier. The other pair of eyes, smaller this time, would be located in the center of its head. To have such well-developed eyesight, this ability must have been invaluable when hunting. This is an animal that relies on its vision. It uses its eyesight to find its way around animals. Not all sea scorpions were blessed with such impressive size. They were the delight of a mollusk. But not just any mollusk. This one belongs to the class of cephalopods. To be more precise, it's a nautiloid genus. When we think of mollusks, we rarely think of a large predator, I grant you. Yet this one looks like a giant squid, and its size is clearly an advantage when hunting. According to estimates, its shell measures between 6 meters or 20 feet long. The giant orthocone cephalopod, a Chimeraceras, Trentonese, fed on prey equal to its energy requirements. Trilobites, but also certain sea scorpions, offered it choice dishes. Using his tentacles, he was able to seize his prey and only release them once they had sunk to the bottom of his enormous mouth. As you'll see, this giant, Orthoceron, is far from the only one to adopt such impressive dimensions. Although the seabed is an idyllic landscape, we're going to have to leave this jewel of the oceans behind. The Silurian period is drawing to a close and the Devonian is opening its doors to us. 
you'll soon realize that the apex predators are very different from what we've seen so far. Their size is much greater. Their morphology and anatomy are different, allowing them to set up a new hunting model. Alpha predators are far more dangerous and aggressive. Let's take a look at one of the largest predators of the Devonian period, the Placoderm, Dunkleosteus. It grows to around 4 meters in length and weighs almost 1 ton. Dunkleosteus is monstrous compared to previous alpha predators we've come across along the way. But size isn't its only peculiarity. Its body is completely covered in bony plates, like a cuirass, protecting it from all dangers. It's a veritable suit of armor that would stop any other aquatic animal in its tracks. This famous armor and its extraordinary dimensions place it at the top of the chain. It's an apex predator. His imposing size and weight did not make him a fast fish in the sea, but he was nevertheless at the top of the food chain because he feared no one no animal could overcome his armor. Its mouth is devoid of teeth. Quite surprising for a large predator, don't you think? But a toothless animal doesn't mean it's devoid of destructive weapons. It does, however, have a very effective jaw. It opens and closes like a chisel, blade against blade, and is very sharp. Dunkleosteus feed on all shellfish living in the ocean at the time. Thanks to their jaws, they can easily crush shells, eating cephalopods with unparalleled ease. If their jaws of knife-sharp bone plates aren't enough, they use the enormous force of pressure their mouths are capable of exerting on their prey. Now we'll take a look at another animal, also a fish, whose strength is just as astonishing. Here we have a Stethacanthus productus. It's nicknamed the Anvil Shark because of its brush-like dorsal fin. Before we talk about its hunting qualities, let's start by explaining how it defends itself. Thanks to its characteristics, no other predator dares attack it. Stethacanthus is a genus of primitive Holocephalus. It was one of the very first cartilaginous fish to appear on Earth. It quickly conquered both the salt and fresh waters of our planet. At the top of its skull you can see that it has numerous dermal denticles. These serve to repel any predators that might have risked an unequal fight. It also has pectoral whips at the base of its pectoral fins. Again, these are formidable defensive weapons that he would not hesitate to use if necessary. Thanks to its size and power, it can take on large animals. It used to feed on primitive amphibians. Over time, it gave birth to a new species, the Acmonisteon zangerli. Its descendant lived in the Carboniferous period and, like its predecessor, enjoyed primitive amphibians. He also hunted an animal whose classification still remains a mystery to scientists, somewhere between fish and tetrapods, the Crassarigenus scoticus. Each of these alpha predators feeds on a specific species, so they don't really compete and they don't hunt each other. They reign supreme in all the world's waters. The Acmonistion gives us the opportunity to talk about the Carboniferous. What do you say we go there right now? Other equally interesting animals are already waiting for us there. The further back we go in time, the more predators we find. They follow the curve of biological evolution and the diversification of species for which they are largely responsible. Thanks to their regulatory work, 
they enrich and maintain healthy biodiversity on land and at sea. Their morphology, physical capacities, and hunting methods are adapted to the species they hunt. Until now, prey has tended to be small or medium-sized, such as trilobites, cephalopods, and small fish. Times are changing, and many new species have emerged. Alpha predators have modeled their evolution on that of their prey. You'll soon realize that the further back in time we go, the more spectacular these prehistoric predators will become. Another notable change is where they live. Until recently, predators were confined to the aquatic environment, but this is no longer the case. Predators feed on animals, so they live wherever life is found. Over the last few million years, predators have managed to establish themselves on the continent, too. So, it was only natural that an alpha predator should also reign on the mainland. Those awaiting us now are fascinating, but also terribly frightening. The first of these is chilling. This is the Heliocoprion. I don't need to tell you what's so special about him. As you can see, his circular, saw-like lower jaw is quite incredible. Extraordinary, even. You'd think it came straight out of a science fiction story. And yet, the Heliocoprion did exist. In fact, it was one of the most fearsome marine predators of its time. For a long time, it was a mystery to us humans. It's hard to perceive reality, to establish a general truth, to attest a fact so long after the fact, and with so few traces to rely on. One thing is certain. The Helicoprion is a cartilaginous fish, and it's precisely for this reason that creating a portrait as close to reality as possible is a tricky business. Unlike skeletal bones, cartilage does not fossilize, so you have to pick up on the few clues present in the remains of the past and then interpret. The first observations and interpretations based on the fossils of the Helicoprion, of which only the spiral dentition has survived the ravages of time, have long been the subject of debate. Scientists imagine this circular, saw-like structure, a sort of prehensile toothed organ on the lower jaw, then on the upper jaw, and a little later on the dorsal fin, and even the caudal fin. In the end, according to the most recent research supported by technology, the most likely hypothesis places this unusual dentition on the lower part of the jaw. The scientists' observations and interpretations go even further, describing it as occupying the entire length of the mandibles without being prominent. In fact, according to their research, a frontal and external position, as implied by the first descriptions, would have been a hindrance for the animal. Water resistance would have been too great for it to survive so many years and take over the oceans. This giant of the seas, measuring nearly 10 meters or 30 feet, had no predators. It was at the top of the chain, feeding on fish or ammonites, depending on the hypothesis. Here again, time is not on our side. For the moment at least, it's hard to say whether one of these diets is more plausible than another. If he was indeed feeding on ammonites, then he was using that circular saw as a can opener, a machine for exploding shells and scrambling those shell-bound animals. The teeth are indeed perfectly suited to this kind of exercise. It's also possible that the Helicoprion used a different method of hunting, lying in wait for schools of fish. It would then pounce on them, opening its mouth wide, this time, the circular saw would have acted as a rotating skewer on which the fish would have been skewered one after the other 
to be taken further and further into the shark's mouth. Death is quick and painless. The fish are sheared off, then dragged backward in just a few handfuls of seconds. We'll have to leave this aquatic phenomenon with its saw-like jaws to keep our next appointment. Dimetrodon is waiting for us. The Dimetrodon is exceptionally large. It could reach 4 meters or 13 feet in length, and up to 6 meters or 20 feet in height, for the largest adults. It weighs up to 250 kilograms or 550 pounds. Make no mistake, despite appearances, this Dimetrodon is not a dinosaur, but a reptile of the Therapsid family. We're in the Permian, and remember, dinosaurs will arrive millions of years later. Now back to Dimetrodon. This species is often mentioned when talking about prehistoric animals. Its distinctive dorsal veil is undoubtedly a factor. However, it's not for this feature, which was very useful for regulating its temperature, that we're going to study it now, but for its status in the food chain, as you may have guessed, there's no need to drag out the suspense any longer, since that's the theme of this video. He's at the top of the food chain, and one of the alpha predators. Its dentition will be the subject of our new study. Its name means two sizes of teeth. This gives you a little clue to the evolution of this species. The teeth on his skull are in fact of two different series. This makes him the precursor of the four types of mammalian teeth. One or two pairs of canine-like teeth are found in related members of this family. It also has a type of incisor. Another noteworthy feature of its dentition is the serrations on almost all its teeth. They appear so fine as to be mere cracks. These serve to make the teeth much sharper enabling them to cut through the flesh of their prey. If its dentition has adapted, it is to attack a new kind of prey. The number of tetrapods and amphibians exploded during this period, and for some time already. An adversary to match these new animals was needed. To complete this armada of hunters, Dimetrodon also had olfactory, Epithelium in its nasal cavity, i.e. a layer of tissue that detects odors. Dimetrodon was probably able to use this sensory advantage to locate and flush out its prey. It feeds mainly on riverbanks and in shallow waters in search of amphibians, but also small fish. Although undoubtedly terrestrial, the Dimetrodon was not yet fully adapted to walking it undulated more than it walked. Another super predator, the Lycanops, used much less energy to move, and moved with greater ease. Its name probably suggests a wolf-like appearance, and you're right to allude to it. Indeed, his name means wolf's face and his physique denotes some lupine traits. Like the Dimetrodon, it too has a differentiation of teeth, but its most impressive feature is its enormous saber-shaped canine. It hints at what an implacable predator he was. This Gorgonopsian therapsid moved around on all fours. Unlike the animal we met earlier, the humerus and femur are virtually vertical. In other words, it walks. But that's not all. Lycanops also has a larger, more efficient musculature. This musculature, combined with its long legs on the underside of the body, rather than on the side, also enabled it to run. Speed was therefore perhaps one of its best hunting assets. He wasn't very tall, measuring just one meter or three feet in length. 
he was small in size compared to other herbivores and carnivores of the same period. However, it could run faster and had more stamina. Its impressive canines promised a quick, efficient kill that left nothing to chance. That's what put him in a position of strength. Hunter, but never hunted. On land and at sea, alpha predators watch over the balance of the cycle of life. They may be scary, aggressive, and even barbaric, but they're far less so than the next ones on our list. Come with me. We're meeting at Trias. We couldn't have wished for a better entry into the Jurassic than this meeting with the God of the Seas. He is extraordinary. Despite his sea monster appearance, he captivates and fascinates mankind. This marine reptile is a fish eater. In other words, it feeds on fish. Its enormous wingspan gives you an idea of the size of the prey it feeds on. As we pointed out earlier, predators adapt to the prey they feed on. Their regulatory role is essential. Biological evolution facilitates the maintenance of this balance. We're living in an age of extraordinarily large animals. Predators are therefore also very imposing animals and do justice to the size of their meal. The Liopleurodon is without a doubt the most advanced of the pliosaurs. It is fearsome and very fast. It is one of the greatest predators of the Jurassic period. It can travel long distances, propelling itself through the water with its powerful front flippers. Its size, initially estimated at 25 meters or 80 feet, has been revised downwards in recent years. Finding the complete skeleton of a prehistoric animal is almost unheard of. After millions of years, only minute traces of their passage remain. Precious, priceless treasures. But these witnesses to a bygone age are far too small to establish with any certainty a completely realistic portrait. As we saw earlier, when we set out in search of answers about the distant past, we have to rely on the few elements found, then interpret and try to make deductions. Thanks to today's techniques, many mysteries can be solved, but mistakes are always possible. As the size of the head was disproportionately large, scientists were quick to point to an equally imposing body. Body and head are generally proportional. This is indeed the case for a very large number of species, but not in pliosaurs. That doesn't make it any less gigantic. Right before your eyes, it's an animal of over 7 meters or 23 feet that moves with spine-chilling ease. Its attitude in the water and its sweeping movements are striking. It seems to be able to fly on the open sea. His predatory instincts awakened, he propels himself through the ocean with a flick of his flippers, reaching a speed far greater than his weight and size would suggest. Often mistakenly categorized as a dinosaur, it is in fact a marine reptile. It is also sometimes confused with pliosaurs, which have long necks characteristic of their species. Pliosaurs, or pliosauroids, are reptiles with more massive heads. With its massive skull, our marine specimen is one of the pliosaurs. In fact, Liopleurodon is the perfect example of a pliosaur. A long, flattened skull, a relatively short neck, and long fins attached to a thick torso, ending in a small tail. The animal's teeth are sharp as knives, making them devastatingly sharp. They're also very long, and rival a dinosaur you know well, the T-Rex. With teeth like that and a weight approaching two tons, 
Lypluridon was the ruler of the seas, he left nothing to chance. When he passed, chaos ensued. Fierce and dangerous, he had an insatiable appetite. How do you think this extraordinary predator managed to flush out his prey? Its size was both an advantage and a hindrance when hunting. Fish could see him coming from a distance and flee to protect themselves. You have to look at its snout to discover the answer. The front nostrils give it an extremely well-developed sense of smell, enabling it to locate prey over long distances. To do this, it channels water through its nostrils to detect the chemical secretions of surrounding animals. When a tantalizing scent is detected, it pounces on its prey with its paddle-like fins. They literally propel him through the water. He can also go at top speed if the hunt calls for it. There's another thing you need to know about this emblematic animal of the Jurassic Oceans, and it's closely linked once again to its nostrils. I'm talking about its respiratory system. Although it was an aquatic animal, it couldn't breathe underwater. Like some marine animals, notably the dolphin you know so well, it had to come to the surface to take a breath of oxygen before being able to dive back to the ocean floor. Lypluridon may have had its moments of glory, but nothing in nature is ever immutable. Life evolves and so does everyone's position in the cycle. Despite its hunting prowess, the mosasaurs, a new species of large reptiles, managed to oust the Lypluridon during the Cretaceous period. We'll have a chance to meet them later on in our journey. Before we enter this new Cretaceous period, we have many other apex predator species to observe. Let's get back on the road. We've got a date with the next one on the list. Meet Nothosaurus. He had a slender body, elongated neck and tail, and long limbs not as good a swimmer. As the Pliosaurs and Plyciosaurs, it was able to cope well enough in the water to flush out prey and easily meet its energy needs. Biological evolution enabled it to develop certain skills. Its palate was closed, separating the nasal passage from the oral cavity. This adaptation facilitated the ingestion of food, even when the animal was submerged in water. His skull was long and flattened, with large openings. It enabled it to swallow large prey. Its jaws were studded with sharp interlocking teeth. No animal could escape. When swimming, Nothosaurus used its tail to propel itself, and its webbed feet to steer and stabilize itself in the water. He moved by undulating his body and moving his limbs, it hunted slowly towards its prey, then accelerated sharply over the last few meters to propel its head through schools of fish and capture prey. Although it hunted ferociously in the water, it was not an exclusively aquatic animal. We might compare it to today's seals. Nothosaurus are very good hunters in the ocean but they regularly return to the shore to rest, perhaps to mate, and also to lay their eggs. Another animal of the same genus lived in swampy regions. This is the Tychonosuchus. It looks very much like a crocodile. It was one meter or three feet high, and around three meters or ten feet high, its limbs were positioned directly under its body, almost vertically. So it walked on all fours. But this quadruped, unlike others of the same era, was quite fast. It has a complex ankle joint and a kind of heel. The latter is an important feature. In fact, a tendon attached to the heel is connected to the calf, and this makes all the difference. 
it increases leverage and thus facilitates movement. Not only can it walk with ease on land, it can also run. That's a major advantage when it comes to surprising and hunting new prey. Its body is equipped for both attack and defense. He has nothing to fear from animals interacting with the same ecosystem as he does. He was equipped with effective protective armor. Its entire body, including its belly, was covered with thick bony plates called scoots. They formed a veritable suit of armor. Let's continue our journey with the phytosaurs. They too have much to teach us. Phytosaurs resemble crocodiles in silhouette. Despite this deceptive appearance, they are not crocodiles. Their nostrils, for example, are not located at the tip of the snout, but higher up in front of the eyes. This characteristic enabled them to conceal their presence. They could breathe while remaining almost submerged, leaving only the nostril hole and the tip of the skull protruding out of the water. There were two main types of phytosaur. They can be distinguished by their jaws. First, there were those with long, narrow jaws lined with conical teeth. These were sharp and interlocked to grip fish firmly. This tooth arrangement is often found in underwater predators. There's a reason for this. They can plant a fish and grasp it firmly while flushing out the water from the sides of the mouth before swallowing. The other group includes phytosaurs with short, wide, and very powerful jaws. The front teeth are fang-like and the rear teeth bladed. The fang-like teeth protrude from the mouth while the back teeth are curved. Thanks to this type of jaw, as well as its predatory physique, this phytosaur was able to attack large land-dwelling tetrapods when they came to drink at the waterhole in the manner of today's crocodilians. From these early encounters, you might think that the biggest predators of the time inevitably had the appearance of a crocodile. No, the next one on the list looks nothing like a crocodile. But I can assure you, he's just as scary as they come. Here's one of the most ferocious carnivores the Earth has ever known. Everything about him exudes violence and barbarity. He's equipped with the finest hunting weapons. His body is voluminous, measuring around 9 to 10 meters or 33 feet long, almost 3 meters or 10 feet high, and weighing no less than 2 tons. Its sheer mass is frightening enough to scare off even the most reckless of dinosaurs. Its bones are heavy and strong. Its legs are long and its front legs shorter. It moves with confidence on its hind legs alone. Its long tail, undulating from left to right, acts as a pendulum, helping it to maintain balance during its movements. Its well-developed musculature and articulations enable it to be quite fast when compared to other dinosaurs of the same era. Fossilized footprints confirm this hypothesis. We are therefore dealing with a fast predator. Its front and rear legs are equipped with sharp claws. They don't hesitate to use them to lacerate the flesh of their prey and cause serious injuries. As if such claws weren't enough for Megalosaurus, they're not its only weapons. It has powerful jaws lined with large, razor-sharp, curved teeth. They're real cutthroats. It can slice, tear, and devour its prey with incredible violence. He's so formidable he'll stop at nothing. It never shudders or runs away. It even attacks large sauropods. Megalosaurus was a dangerous and fearsome carnivore. As you can see, this one attacks a Bonthriospondylus. Unfortunately for the Bonthriospondylus, 
it soon passes from life to death. This scene takes us out of the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. This is undoubtedly the era that saw the most appalling predators of all time. I hope your heart's in the right place. These animals are dangerous, aggressive, and violent. After their passage, the landscape is synonymous with chaos. There's nothing left but the scent of fear and the acrid smell of blood. The greatest predators of all time were undoubtedly Carcharodon tosaurus, Gigantosaurus, T. rex, and Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus seems to be the most imposing of them all. Cacharodontosaurus outstrips Gigantosaurus and T. rex itself. Let's meet each of them and learn more about their species. How did they rise to the top of the food chain? What were their hunting skills? What makes them apex predators? There's only one way to find out. Meet them and study them up close. Faster, bigger, but less intelligent than the T-Rex, the Gigantosaurus made a name for itself in the Cretaceous. It weighed around 10 tons and measured almost 15 meters or 50 feet in length. There is some speculation that this giant lizard could have taken on titanic herbivores such as Argentinosaurus. Bones of this mastodon have indeed been found close to Gigantosaurus. A predator-prey relationship is therefore plausible. Even so, it's hard to imagine that an animal weighing just 10 tons, however ferocious and powerful, could rival the 80 tons of this gigantic herbivore. One possibility that could explain and confirm this predator-prey relationship would be a pack hunting style. Gigantosaurus probably form very small groups, limited to two or three individuals, and gathered only to hunt. This is one of the first animals on our list to rely on the power and efficiency of the group to hunt. Others, just as dangerous, acted alone, but they were no less formidable for all that. Meet the Carcharodontosaurus. It has phenomenal strength. It measures between 12 and 13 meters, or 40 feet according to the latest estimates, and weighs between 6 and 8 tons. Its disproportionate size and power make it an outstanding hunter and a sovereign predator on its home turf. His femur alone measures 1 meter, 26, or 4 feet. Can you imagine? Just one part of his leg was the size of an eight-year-old child. He hunted a wide variety of species, even large herbivores without fear. He was so feared that he would even steal prey freshly hunted by other predators. None of them would have risked combat to recover their property. His posture and charisma alone frightened any terrestrial creature that crossed his path even from a distance. His insatiable appetite, aggressive nature, and dangerousness were known to all. Look at its mouth, it's gigantic. She's one meter sixty, or five feet long, the average height of a fourteen-year-old teenager. But it's also a formidable weapon. Her teeth are sharp and razor sharp. Given the size of her skull, you can imagine that her teeth are also very long, over 15 centimeters or 6 inches. Each of his teeth is almost the size of a human hand. Look at yours. Imagine dozens of teeth as long as that, solid as rock and sharp as an axe. No animal could resist a Carcharodontosaurus bite. 
Despite its extraordinary abilities, over time it gave way to another alpha predator, undoubtedly more intelligent and better adapted to its environment, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Did you know that the first Tyrannosaurus appeared around 140 million years ago, barely larger than a human? Such was the case of Nanagsaurus hoglundi. But towards the end of the Cretaceous, tens of millions of years later, they began to evolve into animals resembling the T-Rex you know. He's undoubtedly one of the most popular dinosaurs. When we think of the dinosaur period, it's often his name that springs to mind. It's also well known for its ferocity. In fact, its aggressiveness, violence, and insatiable predatory instincts have earned it the name of King of the Tyrant Reptiles. It could easily reach a length of 12 to 14 meters, or 43 feet, a height of 5 to 6 meters, or 16 feet, and a weight flirting with 7 tons. Like the previous dinosaurs we studied, it had a large skull, up to 1.50 meters long, or 5 feet. Armed with some 60 teeth, 10 to 15 centimeters, or 4 inches long, some as long as 18 centimeters, or 7 inches, perfectly sharpened, and saber sharp, its mouth could have swallowed a whole man without difficulty. They were always effective, and hardly ever wore out. Every two to six years a new army of razor-sharp teeth sprang from its jaws. Some paleontologists also believe that the unusually large cranial surfaces behind the Tyrannosaurus's eyes must have housed extremely powerful chewing muscles. In addition to its teeth and powerful jaws, Tyrannosaurus had many other assets that put it right at the top of the podium among the world's greatest predators. He has stereoscopic vision. In other words, he has relief vision and a very good sense of distance. Each of his eyes provides a clear image at a certain viewing angle. Taken together and superimposed, these images provide the depth needed to assimilate distances. This also enabled him to register the slightest movement with a fairly wide field of vision. For a predator, this kind of visual capacity is a precious asset if you never want to miss your prey. The T-Rex was also robust and enduring. Walking for a whole day, at an average speed of 8 kilometers didn't frighten it. His body took him where his sense of smell led him. He could also be fast if the occasion presented itself, such as a hunting opportunity. Tyrannosaurus could reach speeds of 25 kilometers per hour, or 40 miles per hour, with strides of around 3.75 meters, or 12 feet. The dinosaur is an emblematic animal of the Cretaceous period. Its predatory characteristics are unquestionable. In fact, that's what it's famous for. 6 meters or 20 feet high, up to 18 meters or 60 feet long, and weighing almost 11 tons, it's a real monster, a Cretaceous Titan. In appearance, it could be described as a giant crested lizard. The first striking thing about this dinosaur is its size, far greater than that of the Tyrannosaurus, which has become a benchmark in its class. But there's more. A long jaw and an army of fine, razor-sharp teeth leave no doubt as to its diet. In its belly, scientists have noted the presence of fish scales, as well as those of other animals, notably land animals. The appeal of this singular dinosaur lies in the way it moves, the environment in which it lives, and the ambiguity of its diet and hunting habits. 
While Spinosaurus is unquestionably terrestrial, it is also an underwater animal. This is one of the features that fascinates dinosaur enthusiasts. The lower part of its jaw already gave some clues to its mixed lifestyle. This terrestrial animal feeds on fish, but it was its bones, and in particular its femur, that shed further light on the mystery. Proportionally, Spinosaurus's femur is much shorter than that of its terrestrial tetrapod contemporaries. Another important anatomical feature is the shape of its feet. The bones of its feet were flat, and the claws of its toes were rather large. This tells us that while it could move about on land, the action required a great deal of energy. For an alpha predator like this to be able to sustain itself and hunt prey, it couldn't afford to encounter such difficulties in its movements. This proves that he didn't live on the mainland all the time but that he sometimes went into the water, at least to feed. The very nature of its bones validates this hypothesis. The bones of terrestrial predators, such as the T-Rex we mentioned earlier, are longer, lighter, and composed of cavities. These characteristics made walking on land easier. Spinosaurus, on the other hand, has solid bones more akin to certain marine animals. It is this high bone density in the limbs that would have enabled this dinosaur to remain submerged in water, rather than floating. Once again, this suggests an animal capable of moving through water. With nostrils ideally located at the top of the head to prevent water from seeping in, we could be dealing with a swimmer. However, Despite its undisputed swimming ability, it seems that the remains of land animals found in its belly are also evidence of this dinosaur's opportunistic side. Some modern-day animals are too, like the grizzly bear. It is an outstanding fisherman, and fish remains its favorite food. But if the opportunity arises or the fishing isn't good, it's easily tempted by other types of prey. There's every reason to believe that Spinosaurus falls into the category of opportunistic animal. Equally at home, in the water or on land, it was one of the greatest land carnivores of all time. He sits proudly on the podium of the world's most accomplished and terrifying alpha predators. Previously, we met a pliosaur. This time, our journey gives us the opportunity to study a plesiosaur. You'll be able to see for yourself the major differences between these two families. The plesiosaur has been the subject of many legends, such as Loch Ness, and has also inspired great names in literature, such as Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth. But as fascinating as these legends are, it's not for its fame that we're going to study it here, but for its abilities as an apex predator. The Plesiosaurus, Hydrotherosaurus, Alexandre, measures around 8 meters or 26 feet. It fishes with its 6 meter or 20 foot long neck. Its neck measures almost two thirds of its body. It has no fewer than 60 vertebrae. Its head, on the other hand, is tiny in proportion to its neck, measuring a mere 30 centimeters. But that didn't stop it from hungrily devouring ammonites, belemnites, fish, and even marine reptiles. For the record, the fossils of this sea behemoth were discovered by Annie Montague Alexander. The dinosaur was named in her honor. The marine reptile we're about to see is frightening, as much for its colossal dimensions as for its uncommon predatory abilities. Tylosaurus was the largest of them all. This Mosasaurus must have reached almost 18 meters or 60 feet in length, 
and weighed up to 15 tons, 15 tons of fearsome danger. Its large head is reminiscent of a crocodile, but a crocodile of inordinate size. The body, meanwhile, is a clever blend of snake and fish. Despite these extraordinary dimensions, the mastodon moves with great ease. It is equipped with powerful fins that allow it to steer as it pleases, but also to move fast enough never to miss its target. Even if the mere idea of him opening his mouth makes your blood run cold, you absolutely must take a closer look at his teeth. They're numerous and razor sharp. As you can see, it also has a second set of teeth in its upper palate. Once the prey has been swallowed, it has no chance of escaping. It could take on any aquatic species that crossed its path. Nothing resisted him. He could eviscerate any prey in seconds. Fish, squid, plesiosaurs, such as the elasmosaurus, pterosaurs, sea turtles, and even other mosasaurs were all within his grasp, if his territorial mind was anything to go by. It also used its long snout to strike and stun its prey. Its skull alone could reach one meter, twenty, or four feet. Look how easily this Mosasaurus, Tylosaurus, captures a Pteranodon. It seems to appear out of nowhere. He manages to propel himself out of the water and makes short work of the bird. He reigns supreme in the oceans decimating even the biggest sharks of his day. He spread terror wherever he went. For all the violence he was capable of, given the sheer size of the animals living at the time, without an alpha predator of this stature, the regulation and biodiversity of marine species would have been compromised. It played an essential role in the oceans throughout its reign, until it disappeared as did many of its contemporaries after the Cretaceous Crisis. If meteorites and volcanoes are going to have a terrible impact on Earth, they're also going to seriously shake up the marine environment. Earthquakes, tsunamis, heat waves, and sudden drops in temperature have altered the biotype we mentioned at the very start of our trip. As you now know, biotope and biocenosis are closely linked. For an ecosystem to survive, the fragile balance between one and the other must be maintained. The land-based activities of the time upset this balance. The biotope, then the biocenosis, would suffer the dramatic consequences of these upheavals. First of all, in the Siberian traps, volcanic eruptions released large quantities of carbon dioxide, undoubtedly acidifying the waters of oceans, rivers, and small streams. The change in pH caused the death of the most fragile species, such as shell plankton and ammonites. The loss of these animals then impacts the rest of the food chain. A new mass extinction loomed on the horizon. But it was the fall of the famous meteorite a few thousand years later that did the damage to many species. It was the domino effect on a massive scale. Many animals became extinct forever marking the history of life. Nevertheless, some of these animals did not disappear completely from the face of the Earth. Even today, turtles and crocodiles are precious witnesses to this tumultuous past. <laughs>